On a typical desert evening in Albuquerque's West Mesa on February 2, 2009, Christine Ross and her dog Ruka set out for their routine walk. Amidst the scorching heat and arid landscape, Ruka's keen sense of smell led him to a startling discovery buried beneath the earth, a solitary human bone marking the tragic encounter with an unknown entity shrouded in mystery and intrigue. West Mesa is nestled on the outskirts of Albuquerque, New Mexico. West Mesa, which has Mexico to the south, Oklahoma and Texas to the east, Arizona to the west, and Colorado to the north, beckons with its alluring charm. On a February evening in 2009, Christine and Ruka strolled along a dry creek bed within an abandoned housing development near Dennis Chavez Boulevard and 118th Street. Ruka uncovered a bone, initially dismissed as typical desert remnants. However, Christine felt uneasy about its shape, so she snapped a photo and consulted her sister, a nurse, who suspected it was a human femur. Alerting the Albuquerque Police Department confirmed the bone's human origin. Subsequent investigations uncovered multiple bodies intertwined, as if embracing. The crime scene expanded as more bodies were discovered. Over three months, officials meticulously combed through the 92-acre West Mesa area, employing heavy machinery and meticulous sieving to excavate 18 feet into the soil, eventually removing over 40,000 cubic yards of earth. Ultimately, they uncovered the remains of 11 women, one of whom was pregnant. The women had been buried for years, reduced to bones. The media dubbed the perpetrator the West Mesa Bone Collector. It took two years for medical examiners to definitively identify the decomposed remains of the victims using DNA and dental records. Fifteen years later, the victims' names are known, but the identity of the perpetrator or killers is still unknown. Jamie Katerina Bell, who was only 15 years old, was the youngest victim. In March 2004, she was last observed at a family get-together close to the Albuquerque airport. She went to the event with Evelyn Salazar, her 23-year-old cousin, and they both departed together. After a few hours, they vanished from view. The two were listed as missing a week after they vanished. Jamie and Evelyn Salazar's bodies were discovered in the West Mesa Sandy Pit. Although she had a past of drug abuse and prostitution, she had changed for the better before going missing and being killed. Sanya Edwards vanished in 2004. She was 16 years old. Even before her remains were discovered buried in the Albuquerque desert, her life had been filled with tragedy. Her original home was in a group home for victims of cruelty and neglect in Lawton, Oklahoma. Since her mother was sentenced to prison for murder when she was five years old, she and her brother have been housed in the facility. Her father and brother had also served several prison terms during her life. In her brief life, she had never experienced security or stability. She escaped the group home at some point in 2003, and there were rumors that she went to Texas to get in touch with her mother. Salia left for Rura, Colorado, after the reunion didn't go well. She was spotted in May 2004 with a bunch of prostitutes a few months later. She had been arrested for soliciting in July of that year. Her street names were Chocolate and Mimi. She was freed back onto the streets following her detention, but never seen again. Gina Michelle Valdez, a 22-year-old, passed away at four months pregnant. Although she was last seen in September 2004, her father didn't formally report her missing for five months. Her two children, Jeremiah and Angelica, were devoted to her. Gina's involvement in the sex industry was also well known. Monica Candelaria, 22 years old, was reported missing two weeks after her last sighting on May 15, 2003. Her family ignored any rumors that she was just another runaway and made a valiant effort to locate her. They knew full well of her hardships and what they perceived as her high-risk lifestyle. She had ties to the local gangs in Albuquerque and had previously been found guilty of solicitation she started using drugs at the age of 17, and she had to sell her body on the streets to pay for them. Though she had called her father on April 13, 2004, to inform him that she was getting married to a man who had recently been released from jail, she was cut off from her family and friends. That was Virginia's final known communication with anyone. Her report of missing status was not made for six months, 
Julanne Cindy Neo was last seen in July 2004. She was 24 years old. She was also a disturbed young mother, frequently abandoning her son Dominic to live with her mother. Julie last spoke with her family on July 15th when she went to see her grandfather. Shortly after the visit, she was reported missing. Following Julie's disappearance, her sister Valerie experienced extreme depression. Two years later, two years after her sister vanished, Valerie overdosed, leaving her family grieving the premature deaths of two young lives. Victoria and Grace Chavez were spotted the last time on June 5, 2003. Similar to numerous other casualties, their absence was not promptly disclosed. Actually, their mother didn't report them missing for a year, and by then, they had probably passed away. Victoria had five convictions for solicitation by the time she was 26 years old. It was said in her missing persons report that she was a known drug user. Once Victoria's remains were removed from the mass grave in Albuquerque, she became the first victim to be recognized. On Valentine's Day in 2004, she was reported missing after going missing for two weeks. When she was spotted in downtown Albuquerque getting into a white pickup truck, she was 27 years old. Her family and friends made a valiant effort to locate her after she vanished. They posted posters featuring her face all around the city and organized neighborhood searches. Later, her family alleged that the investigation into her disappearance by law enforcement was not very thorough. On October 10th, 2003, Doreen dropped her kids off at their Christian school and was last seen. Her family didn't declare her missing for a year. They subsequently said that because of her recent episodes of going missing, they thought she had departed once more and would show up when she was ready to return home. But she never did. Cinnamon Elks was the eldest of the victims discovered at West Mesa. When she was last seen in August of 2004, she was 32 years old. Cinnamon had two children of her own, but she handed her mother Diana custody of them after being involved in sex work and kicking drugs. She'd been taken into custody 12 times for drug possession and 19 times for solicitation. It was known that she was friends with two of the victims. A month after her daughter failed to return calls on her birthday, Diana reported her missing and she was discovered buried next to her. Whatever was going on in her life, Cinnamon would never have missed this date. Officers informed Diana, along with many other families, that Cinnamon had most likely staged a disappearance act and wasn't actually missing. They wouldn't submit an official report until after four months had gone by with no communication. The victims shared several common characteristics. They were predominantly female, aged between 15 and 32, and mostly Hispanic, with one exception being a 15-year-old African-American girl from out of state. Many of them were also mothers. Their disappearances occurred within the time frame of 2001-2005. Investigators noted tire tracks leading to the burial site in satellite images taken between 2003 and 2005, along with patches of disturbed earth. Aerial searches were conducted over the city to identify additional potential burial sites, but none were found despite a thorough examination of numerous locations. The police chief mentioned an extensive investigation of hundreds of other spots, revealing various findings from animal burials to debris across the Mesa. The chronological correlation among the victims, another shared aspect, was their involvement in the sex industry. With the exception of one individual, all of the women were known to have engaged in sex work at some stage, with some also grappling with drug addiction, either past or present. These details played a pivotal role in shaping the direction of the investigation in the ensuing years. One significant challenge encountered early on was the absence of substantial forensic evidence. Despite the discovery of 11 bodies, the advanced decomposition of the remains hindered the determination of the exact causes of death. The medical examiner concluded that homicidal violence was the likely cause, suggesting strangulation or suffocation as possible methods, which would not necessarily leave discernible marks on the skeletal remains. Compounding the issue, the bodies had been wrapped in plastic and exposed to the harsh desert elements for a minimum of four years. This prolonged exposure accelerated their decomposition, further erasing any potential trace evidence that might have been present initially. Notably, 
no personal effects, such as clothing, jewelry, or belongings, were recovered from any of the victims. In essence, the shared involvement in the sex industry and the absence of substantial forensic evidence posed significant challenges for investigators, complicating their efforts to unravel the circumstances surrounding the victims' deaths. The investigation was mostly dependent on witness testimony due to the lack of forensic evidence. However, other than statements about the women's disappearances, no significant information was offered. The victims had tenuous ties to one another due to their prior engagement in street-based sex work in Albuquerque and shared a common grave. If the forensic examination produced any noteworthy results, there is conjecture that the authorities may have chosen to withhold them in order to perhaps identify the perpetrators down the road. As with many cases involving people who had a history of drug abuse or sex work, the inquiry moved slowly at first. One of the most horrific occurrences in Albuquerque's history was the discovery of 11 bodies and an unborn fetus at the same location. The deaths were dubbed the crime of the century, but investigators were hesitant to link them to a serial killer. At first, they played down worries by saying there was no immediate threat because the dead weren't recent and claimed the remains were all old, implying they had been there for years. The police chief assured the public that there was no active serial killer in Albuquerque targeting people, suggesting that the method of disposing off bodies might differ if there were. He emphasized solving the case as a top priority, assembling a team of 40 investigators and seeking assistance from the FBI. However, he repeatedly highlighted the victim's involvement in the sex trade and their high-risk lifestyles, seemingly implying they were responsible for their deaths and lessening the urgency to solve the case quickly. Despite this rhetoric, the families of the victims remained hopeful that the investigation would be taken seriously. After five months, the police announced progress, narrowing down the suspect pool to five individuals, with Joseph Blah being the first on the list. Blah, a local with a history of violent sex crimes dating back to 1990, had numerous encounters with law enforcement related to sex work and drugs. One incident involved him exposing himself to a sex worker, and upon investigation, rope and electrical tape were found in his vehicle. Following a tip from his wife, detectives observed Blah stalking sex workers for four days, driving near where the bodies were discovered. Although his home was searched, authorities did not disclose any findings linking him to the killings. Additionally, his wife and daughter reported discovering women's jewelry and underwear hidden in their shed. That was noteworthy, as numerous families of the deceased had reported missing jewelry. Before the women were found, Joseph had also been charged with multiple counts of sexual assault. He was not apprehended, charged, or found guilty of those crimes until the bone collector investigation got underway. The majority of the middle school students he had forced himself on in the 1980s were the victims of those horrifying acts. He would wait for the kids to get home from school, break into their homes, and then attack them. He was found guilty in 2015 of sexually abusing an eighth grader, a behavior that occurred two decades prior. Sadly, the girl reported the assault to the police at the time, and they collected a essay kit. However, testing of the sample was delayed until 2010, following the discovery of the women's bodies in the desert. Joseph received a 90-year prison sentence for this and multiple more sexual assaults. The police should have done their duty and examined the sample sooner so that the kid's victim wouldn't have to wait 20 years for justice. How many women would have been spared from Joseph's abuse is impossible to estimate. A tree tag discovered close to the graves was the only connection between Joseph and the West Mesa bodies other than his violent past. The tag was linked to a nursery that Joseph, a landscaper, was known to frequent. Joseph is undoubtedly a monster, but the investigators were unable to establish a clear connection between him and the killings in West Mesa. Lorenzo Montoya was the next suspect listed. Additionally, Lorenzo has a lengthy history of abusing sex workers in Albuquerque. He was taken into custody in 1999 for the crime of sexually abusing and strangling a sex worker, and he was taken into custody once more five years later. Additionally, he was repeatedly accused of abusing his partner at home. He had threatened to kill her and bury her in lime, she told the officers. That line of inquiry was flawed, 
mainly because by the time the remains were discovered in the West Mesa Desert, December 2006, marked Lorenzo's passing. Only three miles from where the victims were discovered was his mobile home, where he was shot to death. The manner in which he died made the authorities believe that he was the person who went by the name Bone Collector. He did not intend to pay the sex worker he brought to his house on the day of the incident. He killed her by strangling her with his hands when she demanded payment. Later, Lorenzo was found transferring her body to his truck by her pimp, who had been looking for her. It was obvious the woman was dead since she was restrained with duct tape and cable. When the pimp realized that Lorenzo had killed her, he shot and killed him. The pimp was never prosecuted for the murder. Lorenzo was being held free on bail at the time of his death due to allegations of sexual assault and celiciding. He had discussed killing women and burying them on West Mesa, according to some of his co-workers. When Lorenzo passed away, the police went through his things and discovered pictures and videos on his camera showing him having sex with an unknown woman. There were background noises, like the sound of tape being ripped off a roll, which made people think Lorenzo was getting ready to dispose of a body. Even though the West Mesa bone collector was a prime suspect, the murders were never conclusively connected to him by the authorities. There were many close to the investigation who asserted that Lorenzo's death put an end to the killings. Whether this was because of his passing or because the gravesite was rendered unusable by adjacent house projects is unclear, though. The area surrounding the burial place was substantially developed over time, according to satellite photographs. The retaining wall was built as a result of neighbors reporting floods in the region, just a year prior to the bones being found. The burial place was eventually found in 2009, after this wall unintentionally revealed a femur bone. Authorities stated that it is not feasible to ascertain whether the serial killer persisted in his activities elsewhere and that it is possible that he arrived and disappeared without being noticed. Serial killers frequently move to avoid being caught, which raises the possibility that there are still unidentified victims out there, either in New Mexico or another state. Although the West Mesa location functioned as a disposal site, it is probable that the killings took place in another location. Only two of the five suspects named by the police chief were made public. Numerous people have been connected to the case over time. In an attempt to identify seven women they thought might be related to the killings, the police posted their images in hopes of receiving help from the public. Doubt was raised about the photograph's provenance when it was later found that two of the women were still living and one had passed away from natural causes. Missourian photographer Ron Irwin became involved in the case after police raided his house and studio and discovered a large number of images and documents they thought were connected to the publicly disclosed images. Once the ladies who were initially named as suspects were excluded from the West Mesa inquiry, it became apparent that Ron had nothing to do with the killings, but it took more than a year for him to receive an official clearance, which seriously hurt his career and image. In a similar vein, Lou Fred Reynolds, whom the police believed to be involved based on evidence discovered at his residence, was repeatedly arrested for unrelated offenses, but was never connected to the killings. The police mostly ignored the relatives' questions and rejected information they had independently acquired, despite assurances given to them. Since 2005, Detective Ida Lopez has been tracking an increase in missing sex workers, mostly Latinas with drug connections. However, she encountered opposition while trying to establish a task force to combat the problem. The lack of focus on these cases served to reinforce the notion among offenders that these victims were less dead and would not prompt a significant police response. The names on Detective Lopez's list coincided with those discovered in the mass grave four years later, indicating that this neglect ultimately led to a delayed inquiry. It's impossible to determine whether the outcome would have differed had the department taken her concerns seriously earlier. However, Following the discovery of bodies, it was revealed that one reason the department avoided investigating the missing women was to conceal reports of APD officers mistreating sex workers. Prior to her disappearance, Cinnamon Elks confided to a friend about a rumor involving a police officer allegedly harming prostitutes and burying them in the West Mesa, though official reports never mentioned decapitations. Interestingly, 
she later ended up buried in that same area, raising suspicions. The extent of corruption within APD hasn't been fully disclosed, but in 2014, the city announced Department of Justice oversight following a probe revealing excessive use of force, including fatal incidents between 2009 and 2012, many deemed unconstitutional. Notably, charges against officers involved in high-profile cases, such as the shooting of a mentally ill man, were dismissed. Furthermore, there were numerous allegations of sexual misconduct by APD officers over the years, including assault on sex workers and minors, with few resulting in convictions. These revelations shed light on why the police were reluctant to investigate missing sex workers and underscore the systemic issues within the department. Once all the women were discovered, there was a sense of relaxation about the investigation. However, this prompted many online users to question whether the West Mesa bone collector could possibly be a police officer. The prevailing belief was that law enforcement would invest minimal effort into finding the missing women and show little interest in solving their murders due to systemic corruption within the Albuquerque Police Department. Despite this corruption, Ida Lopez remained committed to seeking justice for the victims, refusing to abandon them based on their circumstances. From the outset, she played a significant role in the investigation, personally conducting over 200 interviews with women who lived and worked on the streets of Albuquerque. Her findings revealed a pervasive fear among these women to report sexual assaults to the police, either because they believed no action would be taken or because they suspected involvement from law enforcement officers themselves. The investigation into the bone collector killings lost momentum after two years, despite Ida's determination and efforts. Similar to many cases involving victims linked to drugs or sex work, the investigation received less priority, despite being a significant crime in Albuquerque's history and being featured on America's Most Wanted. And despite billboards offering a $100,000 reward, and the efforts of detectives like Dirk Gibson, who was the sole investigator by the five-year mark. The lack of public concern and police resources hindered progress. Families of the victims expressed frustration with the police's lack of responsiveness and the perception that their loved ones were not valued. In 2018, these families urged the Albuquerque Police Department to continue searching for bodies, leading to further searches that yielded no significant findings. Despite ongoing efforts, officials believe any remaining victims are likely buried beneath housing developments in the area. After the global financial crisis subsided, construction resumed, drastically altering the landscape from the time when the bodies were discovered. As of 2021, Liz Thompson, a retired homicide sergeant, oversees the West Mesa case, also known as the 118th Street investigation. She mentioned receiving and investigating over 1,200 tips from the public, but chose not to disclose the number of suspects still under investigation. While no official profile of the murderer has been released to prevent altering the killer's modus operandi, Liz did reveal certain traits. She suggested that the perpetrator might have appeared charming or friendly to establish trust with the victims, who were vulnerable women. The meticulous burial of the victims without leaving behind any evidence hints at the killer's capability and knowledge of the remote West Mesa area. Authorities suspect the killer started as a disorganized sociopath driven by bloodlust, but gradually became more careful and systematic over time. In June 2020, a community park was inaugurated at the site where the bodies were found, dedicated to remembering the victims and providing solace to their families. Along the oval path of the park, loved ones have chosen benches and trees to go with each woman's name. Despite the lack of answers, the families cling to hope that the perpetrator, known as the West Mesa Bone Collector, will one day be apprehended, sparing other vulnerable women from suffering the same fate. Despite efforts by law enforcement and the community, the perpetrator remains unidentified, leaving lingering questions and a sense of unease. The opening of a community park at the site of the tragedy serves as both a memorial and a symbol of hope for closure and justice. Thanks for your attention. Please leave a comment, like and subscribe to the channel or email at crimesabroad at outlook.com for more cases.